Good morning and welcome back to the 2021 Summit on Poverty. Thank you so much for joining us again. This is our third day, our last day. I hope that you've been enjoying the summit so far. I know that many people have been connecting and chatting and giving their feedback on everything that they've experienced um, over these last two days within the Hoover chat. So we really, really appreciate you guys joining us virtually um, and just staying with us throughout this whole time. So we are, again, are on day three. This morning, we have a keynote speaker that'll be streaming in virtually, and that is Commissioner Mariah Parker. So we are glad to have her this morning. She'll be coming on at about nine o'clock. And so um, in just a couple more minutes, we're going to do some welcomes on the stage, and then you'll be able to see Commissioner Mariah Parker um, right after that. Also this morning, we have workshops again that are available to you um, at 1030. And those will be, we have two workshops happening. And so take a look at those, see if that's something that you want to attend. One of the workshops is a repeat. So if you missed it, um, it's about collective trauma. If you missed it, you definitely want to see that workshop. So take a look at that. Also, if you're inside of your app, you're gonna start seeing the videos being uploaded to the different sessions that you've experienced over these last couple of days. And so if there's something that you missed or something Something that you wanted to see, you'll be able to review and take a look back at what happened inside of those workshops. Um, again, we want you guys to connect inside of the Hoover app, and we are going to continue to keep this Hoover app open even after the summit. I had a great question come across my in, in my messages on the Hoover app last night, and it was, what are your action plans? And so I actually want to turn that back over to you all and ask, what are your action plans? What are your action steps after coming to the summit, experiencing these workshops, being inspired and impacted by all the information that you received? What are you going to do with it? Because this summit is just set up to be a catalyst for change. The real change happens when you, the individuals, the community gets out there and starts to take action with, because of all the information that they received today. So we hope that you have some action steps. SDC will be talking about their strategic plan later on in the day. So if you stay with, stay with us through the, um, at 12 o'clock for the annual meeting, you will be able to see what SDC is going to be doing in the future. We have some new things coming up, some new programming that's actually gonna be taking place. So we want you to participate in that. If you did not register for the annual meeting, there's still time for you to do so. Um, so we want you to go ahead and go on to the registration page on summitonpoverty.org and you'll be able to find registration there and you can register for the annual meeting. Um, so yeah, we just want you to partake in everything that's going on. But again, I ask you, what are you going to be your action steps that you're going to take after the summit is over? We come together collectively as a community, as individuals, practitioners who are doing this work. And so the whole point of this is for us to take the information, not just to take it in, but to do something with it, for it to inspire us to action not just be a transaction between, uh, of information between one person to another, but actually cause transformational change. And that's going to be something that you're going to hear throughout the annual meeting later on today. Transformational change. So keep that in mind. So in just a couple moments, you'll be seeing um, our CEO take the stage. And we just hope that you stay with us to stay for the workshops. Uh, again, our keynote speaker, Commissioner Mariah Parker, will be coming up very shortly. And then we'll see you again at the annual meeting. Thanks. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, 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 good. Well, we are on day three of the Summit on Poverty. So I'm glad you guys stuck it out with us. Hello again to the virtual audience out there. Um, if you're here in person, you can always chat with the virtual audience as well. You can take, go to your Whova app and you'll be able to chat and see what's happening in our virtual world. But we are getting ready to get started with today's summit. And we have our CEO, Dr. Hinton, who's gonna come do a welcome. Later on, we're gonna have Commissioner Mariah Parker come and she's gonna be streaming in live virtually. And then we have some workshops we're gonna participate in around 1030. And then at 12, we're gonna have our SDC annual meeting. So we have a lot going on today. We hope that you all can stick it out with us throughout the day, especially the virtual audience. Um, and again, if you have not registered for the annual meeting, you wanna do so and you can still do so on the website, summononpoverty.org. You can still register right now. So we're gonna have Dr. Hinton come and do a welcome. 
So why don't we give him some love while he comes to the stage? Uh, to the virtual audience and also to everyone that's here today, good morning and welcome to the third day of our summit. Uh, the, the first two days have been amazing. Uh, the speakers have been great. The breakouts have been great. I've had an opportunity to talk to people here in the audience and sit at the table and reflect with them. And it's been a it's been an uplifting and a rewarding experience for me personally. And I hope you're getting the same thing. Um, no, this has been an interesting two years. And I'm going to say two years because when we talk later on this afternoon, it's going to be talking about our annual meeting, but we're going to be talking about what happened in 2020. And so my brain is still entrenched in 2021, but I'm going to go back in time and talk about some of the, 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 the things that happened in 2020 that actually have done a lot to, to kind of bring SDC to the forefront of where it wants to go in the future. So don't want to take too much time because there's some a great program in place today. We, my uh, commissioner, uh, Commissioner Tolls will be next, but welcome, enjoy. I look forward not only to the today, but I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hinton. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? I have to give a big shout out to our virtual audience. Can we give them a big hand for being with us? Thank you, thank you. Realities, reflections, and recovery. Surviving and thriving through the year 2020. Over the past couple days, we have delved into issues surrounding poverty with the intention of exposing the root causes of it while working on what SDC can do to bring an end to generational poverty in Milwaukee. We've discussed how the first thing we can do is tell the truth. What have we always been told? The truth will set you free. And the truth is we know, we know people that the deck is and always has been stacked against us. It's been stacked against black and other people of color and that has not been accidental. It is by design. Systems, policies and laws have been put in place since we arrived in this country that oppress us and prevent us from accessing the American dream. The American dream being, according to the dictionary, the ideal by which equality of opportunity is available to any American, allowing the highest aspirations and goals to be achieved. We've heard confirmation of how debilitating and traumatizing poverty is and how we all are impacted by it. We also heard what we know to be truth, that education is the pathway out of poverty. Dr. Pedro Nagara told us yesterday that poverty is not a learning disability. Let me repeat that. We were told on yesterday that poverty is not a learning disability. That education is the key 
to breaking patterns of poverty. The doctor told us we have to figure out how to use education to bring about change and that we have to show our kids that education can change their lives. Nothing changes if nothing changes. SDC is committed to empowering people with the resources to move beyond poverty. The work that needs to be done that we are going to have to do and SDC is getting ready to go to battle you all. Like I said yesterday, it's surely this is going to be a war because we're going to call out some people in this city so that we can make some changes. The work is going to be hard. We know that. And we're going to need help. It's time, people. It's time for us all to be bold and take action. It's time to call in the cavalry. And like Mayor Lumumba told us on Tuesday, we're the cavalry that we've been waiting for. Yes, we are. We're the cavalry. And it's up to us to make a difference and change this issue in our city so that our children will have an opportunity to grow up and not just survive, but thrive in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Before I take my seat, I want to thank everyone who has joined us at this year's Summit on Poverty. For those of you who are here in person and all of you who have joined us virtually, we hope it has been a learning experience for you and one that you will use to take action to help improve the quality of life for the poor living in our community. Thank you. All right, we wanted to make sure everything was good on the tech on the virtual side before I took the stage. So we are getting ready to have a introduction from Lieutenant Governor. So we have a video from Lieutenant Governor that we're gonna cue right now. So if I can call your attention to the screens. Hey everybody, I'm Mandela Barnes, Lieutenant Governor. And I just wanna thank everyone for attending the Social Development Commission's 2021 Summit on Poverty. And I'm honored to be here virtually with the people who have been on the SDC front lines, especially as it relates to the hard work to fight and solve poverty-related issues. And not only from your leadership positions or professional backgrounds, but also from your lived experiences. Too often we find that the lived experience portion of this equation is both often missing. It's also one of the most important perspectives in these conversations like you all been having at the conference this year. Now, the Social Development Commission has been a leader in exposing and also a leader in disrupting the experience of poverty that so many folks continue to face. It's been able to empower people with the resources to move beyond poverty, giving folks who experience poverty influence over policies and the resources that impact their daily lives. And also attacking the root causes of poverty and inequity that people are continue to face. It's being shaken up the status quo. And we know that this work is central to making Wisconsin a more fair, just, equitable, and sustainable place to live. This is a vision that I know that you all share and have dedicated yourselves to. Now, highlighting the importance of having conversations around poverty and its barriers, namely trauma, cognitive dissonance, isms, politics, and systems, especially here in Wisconsin, is the work that we know we all have to do. And 
Milwaukee's unfortunately home to some of the greatest challenge, but it's also home to some of the greatest opportunities and greatest treasures. And as we continue to grapple with this pandemic, we need to make sure that access is available to everyone. As we deal with the racial injustice and disparities, we know that we can't settle for a return to what we knew as normal, but rather we have to pledge to continue to push forward to make this state and this country a healthier, stronger, more equitable, and a more sustainable place than it has ever been before. So I just want to say thank you so much. I want to congratulate you all on a successful Poverty Summit. I want to thank the SDC staff and everyone, all the organizers, all the supporters who make this work possible. And just know that together we can win this fight. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, Ooh, good morning, SDC, and our virtual audience and our in-person audience. How's everybody doing this morning? I need y'all to 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 put pick the energy up because we are not we are in our stretch, y'all. We we did this is our first. I think I believe this is our first year going three days. Remember, I told you, Dr. Hinton always gives us a new mission every year and every year we meet or exceed. So I'm excited that we are coming to that time. So, you know, many times you've heard us mention our planning coalition that comes together that helps plan this summit on poverty. Um, and because of the work that they do, a lot of times it's hard for them to come and stay for long periods of time at our Summit on Poverty because the people that they serve have tend to have emergency needs, just like the people that we serve. So frequently throughout this time, we were able to pull on those folk when we needed them the most for workshops that we thought were key and critical, for information that we needed to get out um, that they specialized in and every time they rose to the occasion. So I want you all to pay close attention to our, um, our tribe, uh, you know, our team that helps make this content uh, relevant and concise and delivered to you in a way that's conscious and allows the people who are receiving it that we're talking about to hear it in dignity and encourage them. So when you see these signs next to me that say, you know, we thank you to our planning coalition, I want you to remember who those people are because they show up for SDC. They are, they are allies um, of people who are living in poverty and they are allies to SDC. So we appreciate each and every one of our planning coalition partners that stood in the gap and helped us uh, provide this very relevant content. Dr. Wesley, Dr. Wesley runs his own organization, but because he believes in the mission of SDC so much, he took time, he, he, he comes from Madison. He took time to produce that workshop that you all were raving about yesterday, Dwayne Marks um, from St. A's. They run um, critical agencies, but they took time to show up because they believe in this work that we do. So I just want us to give them a round of applause and all of our planning coalition partners, Jay Tucker, Solana Patterson Ramos. I, I hated to start naming names because I didn't wanna forget people, but I want you to refer to that list because they are just as critical as anybody else that shows up here and gives of themselves um, so that we can improve, you know, our quality of life. And then, um, of course, we want to remember to thank Ascension Hospital. Their leadership, Bernie Sherry, was so gracious to Dr. Hinton. I don't know if you all remember, but Bernie Sherry and uh, um, 
Dr. Michael Lovell stood in allegiance with Dr. Hinton um, at our last summit on poverty in 2019 and committed that they would stay in this partnership with us because they believed in the work that we were doing. And they showed up again this year. They, they could have, you know, like most businesses who were impacted by COVID, one of them being a hospital system and a university system, they could have very well said, you know, I'm sorry due to COVID, we can't, but they did but they did. And we wanna, we wanna make sure that they understand um, that we are grateful for them. And then all of our other participating sponsors, again, you didn't have to, but you did. So we're excited that we are in our day three stretch. Chantel, am I okay? Okay, don't, you know, cause I, I'll do like, I've been around Dr. Hen for a long time. So I'll drag y'all, okay. Okay, so I am here to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Mariah Parker. Mariah Parker is part of a new wave of young women of color entering politics. She first made headlines after being sworn into the Athens Clark County Commissioner as a commissioner at age 26. That's a trend we got. Our, when, when you hear people say young people aren't in this, you tell them that's a lie. Because we've talked to how many people this week who are young and who are in this fight. So I digress. With her, <laughs> she was sworn in with her hand on a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X held by her mother. Photos of her taking the oath went viral highlighting the growing numbers of millennial black women making their voices heard in local politics nationwide. Mariah is also openly queer, a hip hop artist. Her stage name is Lingua Francois, a PhD candidate in linguistics at the University of Georgia, where she is also a graduate teaching assistant in the Department of Language and Literacy Education and a community organizer dedicated to transformative politics and civic engagement. As a commissioner, she is focusing on creating economic stability and racial justice, as well as criminal justice reform and raising the minimum wage. Between the release of a critically acclaimed debut album and her tight election to the county commission, Parker has garnered the attention of CNN, the New York Times, Teen Vogue, National Public Radio, Al Jazeera, The, Na the Nation, Afropunk, The Root, The Bitter Southerner, Performer Magazine, and others for her outspoken commitment to racial and economic justice and her electrifying live performances and presentations, which all audiences to uh, which lead all audience, audiences to self-reflection and critical action in their personal lives and communities. Mariah is also a co-host of Waiting on Reparations, a show on iHeartRadio about hip hop and politics and where they explore the history of public policy and its impact on hip hop life. What hip hop culture tells us about our political reality and the role of hip hop in shaping our political future. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome our keynote speaker for this morning, Mariah Parker. Thank you so, so much for that warm introduction and to everyone here this morning um, for the Social Development uh, Commission Summit. Um, it's my great honor to be here speaking with you all about my personal experience with self-advocacy, self-liberation, and how these lend ourselves to collective liberation. Now, we're focused on the topic this year of surviving and thriving in 2020 and beyond. And if you're anything like me, I know that you found 2020 to be extremely bewildering. We experienced the largest uprising in American history, intense social isolation, the loss of loved ones. For many, it came with economic precarity and its traumas, and so I wanna start by inviting everyone to draw your breath deep, deep down to your stomach. 
exhaling with intention and savor that we made it, that we are making it still. 2020 was bewildering, but life has taught me that bewilderment is fundamental to the good work. That to be shocked by what you see is good because it means that your eyes are open. Out of the whirlwind of last year emerged a new consciousness. We found ourselves bewildered as the purposeful inadequacies of our existing system were laid bare. Millions then chose to use the opportunity to retire or to reevaluate their careers, choosing to no longer settle for the crumbs thrown by employers who proved they would pay pennies for us to put our lives on the line. We're now seeing tens of thousands of workers striking in demand that their work and their lives be fairly valued. We came to understand deeply how our personal health is tied to the health of our communities. We watched George Floyd die, and in the days and months afterward, the images of millions marching in the street emblazoned our unblinking eyes. And municipalities from coast to coast shifted resources into healing justice and non-punitive, non-carceral solutions to crises and their underlying sources, prying the grip of new Jim Crow from around our political imagination. This two-step of bafflement and cohesion reminds me of the old phrase, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Made famous by MIT monster brain, Noam Chomsky, it's a sentence well known among linguists. It shows that grammar isn't contingent upon semantics. Basically, that a nonsensical sentence can still make sense. In a way, it can be a lot like life. While the content seems impossible, the whole, when analyzed, adds up. I mean, look at me. I may control hundreds of millions of dollars as a county commissioner and be a year out from a PhD, but I am still a queer Black femme from the South who stumbled into Athens, Georgia, chasing love, only to fall asleep on that boy's friend's couch and live there while working at a diner, only to somehow get into graduate school, only to battle with addiction and depression, only to write music about it, only to fall in love with the city I'd found to be my home, only to decide to run for office so I could try to change that city and to then somehow win, only to be sitting here before you today. It sounds fantastical, but when it all comes together, it somehow still makes sense. And you, perhaps you're here today, living out your once fake sounding hopes as a scholar, an activist, an elected official, whether their suggestions of fakeness rain down the chain of your less than perfect personal history from doubters or came splattered in red ink on your less than perfect essays, or simply resounded in your head with no outside impetus. It all came together to bring you here to hear this. It has been a bewildering time, but bewilderment, the shock and uncertainty about how it'll all make sense in the long run, bewilderment is a telltale marker that we are doing something great and hard and worth doing. I know that's not just from the pandemic. I know this because to my only surviving grandmother, my life seems like living science fiction. She was the grandchild of sharecroppers and hollow Saponi Indians herself and sees the world through a gray mist now and hears it only in bursts. The youngest of her seven children, my mother, was the only in her family to attend an integrated public school. The others left school rather than integrate because they knew what would happen to them. They'd be spit on and yelled at and dragged through the schoolyard dirt by fistfuls of hair and have their souls fractured by the dubious expectations of white teachers and administrators and the PTA. And it happened to my mother, as expected. But she stuck with it nonetheless and wrote a future for herself as the first in our family to go to college. My grandmother might have been terrified on my mother's first day of school, but at the same time, the idea that her children would be beaten mercilessly for seeking an education made some kind of sense to her in this historical context. That kind of thing happened all the time. But that her grandchild writes headlines like queer linguist firms, legislator, headlines, music festival next weekend. Well, it sounds fake, frankly. And in this instance, as in 2020, as in many moments of our lives, 
Bewilderment is proof that we are doing the hard and necessary work of self and collective liberation. Back to science fiction for a second. Most science fiction is grim because the anxieties of the present make that kind of future easiest to imagine. Think about it, you had Philip K. Dick with his mind mangled addicts and his existential androids. Octavia Butler imagining a future for the human race as abused alien abductees. And even while laughing, Douglas Adams painted a reality where the whole of earth blew up under mismanaged bureaucracy. Present day depictions of my generation and those younger aren't looking great either. We're restless, shiftless, internet addicted and entitled whiners. Some of us already struggle to keep the lights on and when Sally May comes calling upon graduation, that will only get harder. We're living in a time where there has got to be a change in power. We are called to write new science fictions, brighter ones. Using the codes of power we have been taught and with our very lives as our pen and paper, lest we settle for the futures inscribed by Dick Butler and Adams, are the critics around and inside us who cry fake, and by our forebears who at times may wonder where our precious bootstraps have gone. And as Butler once said, first, forget inspiration. Habit is more dependable. Habit will sustain you whether you're inspired or not. Habit will help you finish and polish your stories. Inspiration won't. So I call upon you here now today to make bewilderment a habit in the bold and everyday writing of our collective future. Things may go back to normal, but it is critical that we keep our eyes open because bewildering things are all around us all the time if we are willing to see them and not to look away. Get used to bewilderment now so that when opportunities reveal themselves to you, you recognize them for what they are and seize them before they vanish. Because courage, true courage, means seizing opportunities that may not be obvious or logical. It may be the chance to turn down that promotion so you have continued time for your art and your family. It may be the choice to move back home to the town where you're from and grow something beautiful in a place where there is none, rather than move away into somewhere bustling and sexy. It could be the chance to get out of the way when someone more in need, someone less privileged than you needs a moment to shine. The opportunity to put your poems to music on protest placards to burn through the midnight writing that op-ed you're not sure the paper will publish. To march shoulder to shoulder in a crowd of thousands during a, during a deadly pandemic. To get maced, beaten, arrested. The moment you're asked to help someone who seems entirely unlike you, but needs you, really needs you. We'll be called to make irrational choices. The scoffing will go on and it'll be hard to tune out. But if you stall, even for a second, you may lose the chance. So shape up right now, get used to knowing or not knowing rather how it all fits, but knowing that the grammar of your future will cohere, even if its content is wilder than your grandmother could imagine. I know this too, because in the fall of 2018, 2015, excuse me, I came close to ending my life. I had these stories of growing up not fitting into any neat racial, gender, or sexual attraction boxes available to me in school. I thought about how I ought to be a prodigy, just like my parents thought I'd be instead of squandering my doctorate, partying heartily, lost in the gox I get, looking like chocolate broccoli, but not the glock and key, feeling watching me constantly because I braided and straightened until the grade 10th when I decided I was kind of tired of homogenization. But ain't it changed since? Might look like Angie Davis if you're racist, but on closer observation, they might say I'm whiter than mayonnaise is. As an adult, reflecting with sorrow upon the difficult choice I had to make when I determined that, though pregnant, I was not ready for parenthood. And the way that it continued to haunt me because I did not share the story with anyone. I had all these stories and all these voices swirling around inside my chest like coal ash, burning me alive from the inside. Young, queer, black, poor, 
and und with undiagnosed mental illness living in the South. I did not know how and if speaking my stories would help, but I decided to try. The only other option was to end it, or so it felt. The stories had to go somewhere, or I had to go somewhere, or so it felt. It felt like it had been a mess so long, I'd forgot the meaning of cleaning, and only magic could patch it up, so I was dreaming a genie. By which I mean that I'm dreaming of freedom, but freedom is fleeting. By which I mean between seeing people beaten and bleeding on our TVs, on the daily, on the weekly. Just wanted to relax a bit, crack a paps and watch some videos of cats. And I'm wishing these idiots in Athens would quit with the classism. But I'm really not a great activist because everyone want to complain about the state of the system. Congratulate themselves on Facebook for paying attention. And homie, I know you're right, but if nobody mobilizes a noble fight, we stay enslaved for a century. I wish something given an ish would fix it. I wish given an ish was as simple as was the Dixie. The only way I had to fix it was cashing my chips in. So I guess to fix the system, first I had to fix me. And so I took the first step. I booked a show at the bar where I worked, the first hip hop show in downtown Athens in a decade. And it set a hard deadline. I had two months to write these stories so that I could say them out loud in front of people and finally be rid of them. The show came and I got on stage absolutely terrified. I bantered awkwardly with the audience, got my beats mixed up, dropped my lyrics, squinted dumbly into the blinding stage lights, got my ankles tangled up in microphone cords, and I rapped about some of the hardest things in my life. I rapped about growing up with a mother who was an addict, in a neighborhood with no resources, in a school where children of neither race accepted me, and I rapped about growing up with a fixation on the possibility that I was not meant for this world. And then I should simply stop being here. I rapped about feeling like I didn't deserve love and never find it. And how when I did find it, it stung sharper than loneliness. And I said these truths aloud to crowds of three people, then 13, then 30 never knowing what the next step would be, always so sure before I took the stage that the anxiety of sharing myself might kill me. But on the contrary, after saying these things aloud, owning them and this opening conversation about them with others, I came to savor them in a way. I thought I'd written raps to rid myself of these stories, but really writing them allowed me to turn them over in my palm, to study them, to hold them up to the light, discover their sparkle. And so I held them aloft on stage like a sword, protecting myself from the would-be attacks of detractors. In making bewilderment a habit, I learned the connection between liberation of self and collective liberation, a secret I'll share with you now. I knew my terror was worth it in part because I met so many people Emerging equally sweaty as me from a jostling audience to say, me too, girl. They told me I talk white. I hid my pregnancy. I wanted to end my life. I was the only out queer in high school. And I found that contrary to killing me, it gave me new life. I found that my experiences were not rare. I found that to model radical honesty is to invite others to let down their walls too. I came to see that when we make ourselves vulnerable, it creates space for others to love their truth and to emancipate themselves. And the space created, that space of mutual seeing, is where coalition begins to foam, where movements creep out. I say all this because the pandemic has opened our eyes to the inadequacies of our existing systems and drawn folks into coalition to fight for collective liberation. But what shape and what principle should this action take? I say all this because I believe that the path to liberating ourselves and in turn liberating our communities requires us to destigmatize failure and find strength in vulnerability. Embracing failure and vulnerability is the first step of the radical self-love needed to be well enough to undertake the good work of liberating us all. Because the fact of the matter is, we will fail a few times. Our protests will lack clear vision at first. 
Our job applications will pile up in the rejection bin. Our radical necessary liberatory research studies will be rejected for, with a smirk. The language of our conversation will be outdated and sting someone, but to succeed, we must love ourselves through it. And not ourselves, as in I'ma love me and you go on love you. I mean that we have to hold tight to that space of mutual seeing and love each other across it, despite our mistakes or perhaps because of them, because we understand that making mistakes is human and necessary to the work. This is principle because learning to love ourselves, especially in times like these, is healing. But it is also epistemically fruitful. The wounds left by transphobia, anti-Blackness, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, these wounds can act as a powerful source of knowledge, a kind of expertise, if harnessed. Because who's more expert on the need for universal health care than one of our trans sisters who has struggled to access gender affirming care? Or to the strain of capitalism than a worker making less than a living wage? Or more aware of the failings of our police state than a gunshot victim? Or more hip to the cruelty of our for profit health care system than that same gunshot victim begging onlookers not to call an ambulance? for fear of an emergency room bill. And who's more well-versed in the mechanisms of our school to prison pipeline than the troublemakers in our classrooms? Or more in tune with the need for free higher education than the newly graduated Gen Z when those Sally Mays calls start coming? The closer to the action you have been, the lower your center of gravity the more directly you are positioned to spring into the work, the scholarship, the organizing, the art, that collective liberation will require. And frankly, our lived experiences of the con consequences of bad institutional policy, this lived experience and integrity about it, integrity about it, are exactly what we ought to start demanding of our leadership. Because for far too long, even those who have struggled have to paint a rosy portrait of themselves in order to attain seats of power necessary to change the conditions that the fire in which they were forged. And that must end too. We must demand leadership like that of Lucy McBath, whose son Jordan was murdered at a gas station in Florida by a man who objected to the music Jordan was playing and invoked Florida's stand your ground law as his defense. After the Parkland shooting, Lucy decided enough was enough and ran for Congress in Georgia's sixth congressional district, where she now serves. We must demand leaders like my friend Imani Scott Blackwell, who once having been kicked out of high school herself and who right now is navigating the gauntlets of undergraduate life at the University of Georgia, go dogs. Amani, who ran for school board in Athens on a radical platform that addressed the needs of queer, black, brown, and low-income public school students like the students she had been. And if that, leadership's in, if that kind of leadership is in short supply, we must become the leaders. Those of us sitting in this audience today who might be bewildered at the thought of holding a seat of power or running for their school board or their county commission or leading the march writing the op-ed. Those folks have what it takes because they have lived a kind of knowledge that no textbook can teach you. And if that leadership is in short supply, we, we must become the leaders. We must contend for and take the power. And those among us with the privilege to hold power, perhaps because of our advantages of socioeconomics or race or gender, must cultivate that leadership in our midst so that we may have representation of that lived expertise within our halls. Because those on high cannot and will not tell us at the margins how to live if they cannot see us as we see each other. We have to, we, those on the corners, in the dark, in the shadows, for now, must throw on the cape 
and leap from the phone booth because no one can be trusted to save ourselves but ourselves. So how do we contend for power? I've talked some about building coalition by creating spaces of mutual seeing by sharing stories. I've talked about embracing bewilderment to take the courageous steps necessary to share our hidden selves out loud in public as a means of inviting others to do the same, to build that coalition, to liberate others as a necessary step in building a movement for collective liberation. And to create that space in a classroom or a discussion group or a book club, or even in a politically obvious space like the steps of City Hall is an important and hard part of that. These folks who you liberate through being yourself will be your army when it's really time. But creating that space of mutual seeing in the hard scrabble and wholly forgotten corners of our communities is hardest and most important. I suspect you all have had much conversation on this, on the summit about poverty. Without folding these corners into the center of our movements, our movements don't pass muster. We cannot simply be satisfied with liberating ourselves. We have to bring everyone everyone with us. And while I found liberation within hip hop and speaking my truths to crowds of three, then 13, then 30, then 300, I also discovered that cultural change is not enough to ameliorate the harms of segregation, of discrimination that so many of us were talking about in the songs that we wrote and shared. It may have been a cultural revolution in Athens to bring together beatsmiths and MCs and b-boys and DJs from all corners of our city in a city that while renowned for its music culture remained segregated culturally until that era, 2015. It might have been liberatory to bring those folks together to see that they were not the only ones who were in their basements, in their bedrooms, trying to master their craft, and that they belonged, that the city center belonged to them as much as anyone else. It might have seemed like a cultural revolution, but ultimately what I found is that the stories we were sharing through our art were all crafted in the furnace of public policy. That when I heard my brother talking about making the hard decision between continuing to work at Wendy's for 725 or going back to selling dope, that was driven by public policy. When I get a text message from a friend who said their childcare fell through and they weren't going to actually be able to make their set, that was driven by public policy. Or another friend who said that they couldn't make the trip because the buses started running, stopped running at nine. It was a choice of public policy. When I talk about friends growing up without fathers because those fathers were incarcerated, it was a choice of public policy. And that in order for us to tell new stories, stories of our fellow selves, not just the limitations we had faced, but enact the kind of future we would wanna see for ourselves and for our children. We needed not just cultural change, but policy change. And so in my case, I ran for office. Because if America's scared of us, it's only fair because you gotta crack a couple eggs to make an omelet. The trauma is disproportionately distributed upon the darkest skin and it ain't gonna get any better from watching Dr. Filler vanish in a flash of very dust or willed away by optimism like you Sagittarius or lift it off while a swing and coming for the carious chariots or charities cheesing when people thank them very, very, very much. It's walking down every street and knocking on every door and telling the neighborhood we ain't taking it anymore. Restoring the civil rights of every felon that you know, get them registered to vote and heck telling it to the polls. Cause if your Senator won't say the black lives matter till that guy have a bye, go and get up off my ballot. The day we organize in more than we complain about it, it's any one of us for president and lingo in the cabinet. So I went out in my district with a clipboard on foot in the most hopelessly dangerous place in Athens, Georgia in the eyes of the local public imagination. I stood on strangers' porches and knocked on doors and waited breathlessly as they did not open. I stood there waiting and waiting, nervously tapping my pen on my clipboard and jiggling my heel and my shoes. 
I waited as the doors did not open. I walked away. And my experience in an MC, having faced bewilderment with unblinking eyes and seen what embracing it could yield, I walked away knowing that not only did it not kill me, it wouldn't. Even though sometimes I, when I knocked, my heart would rev uncontrollably as the doors actually opened. I delivered my unpolished spiel, my voice coming across faint and dry as cracked parchment paper, but I spoke. I gave my elevator pitch to smoke shrouded silhouettes through locked metal screens. And I asked folks what was going on in the neighborhood. What change did they want to see? I gave them my honest, authentic self and invited them to do the same. And frankly, most people were wholly taken aback by the question or by mere presence on their doorstep. Change? Hmm, I can't really think of anything right now, I guess, they would often say. Despite the fact that this part of town had the highest child, rate, child poverty rate in the city, the highest rates of crime, the highest rates of unemployment, crumbling infrastructure, inadequate housing, people would still say, I can't think of anything right now, I guess. The hope of change was so foreign to most people that nothing came to mind when asked. So if they listen, I tell them my ideas. I tell them about how the idea of abolitions existed a long time, since before the founding fathers penned their documents, ever since they brought us to this continent, a long line of thinkers pondered it, white and black fought for it, watching bombs fly from the people in the cotton fields, and often still we sitting on trial, slave catchers given badges, prisons built all the time, Imagine if we prioritize strong ties in the neighborhood so that they stay able to stop crime. That's the mission of abolition. It's been this for a minute. An insistence for independence, we've been a march fight. In the alleys with our allies, the ballot with the power of the people, we could finally see freedom for our kind. We talked about reforming, restructuring, reimagining our criminal justice system, which profiles our young black men since their mothers and fathers to jail for petty crimes like marijuana possession, making it impossible for folks to attain higher education, to attain good jobs, to even attain the public housing where I come to meet the folks I talk to. Take for example, Fernanda, we works his ass off from nine to five at the plant just to keep his finances handled. Here's mysterious voices that tell him to kill himself and honestly, he's doing fine. Pretty brilliant bill of health, a daughter on the honor roll, his heart and soul a goddess, so he calls her while he's almost home while sonning his Honda. What a wanted marijuana smoke. Just trying to cope was what he told the officer who stops him while he's on patrol, but now he's in the system, and his sisters and his aunties are looking after his daughter, and he wonders how they're gonna eat. Voices used to whisper, now they start to scream, so he needed to see a doctor, not a box of standard blocks and concrete. I'd ask, what is justice? For whom is it constructed? The mightiest of millionaires, the lowly and the luckless? What is justice? For whom is it constructed? Is it for healing the hurting and or dealing soccer punches? I suggested funding, economic and social development actually supports black futures. And some didn't believe me and did not like me very much, but still we shook hands and I leave shaken, but unscathed. And on the block, the crime center of the district where I lived, I'd spinelessly sidle up to men with malt liquor stained beards and malt liquor stained shirts who swayed on the cracked pavement where they stood. And I told them my ideas. I said, you know, some might call me a hottie like the metal when the kettle sings. I wanna be subcommandante, but I'll settle for a Senate seat so I can put somebody penniless as head of treasury and every debt could be forgiven, medical and everything. And while we're at it, plan a plot of fennel leaf and winter greens on every street and pay incarcerated folks reentering to tend the beans. So every neighborhood has got a plate of food because when our plates are full, that makes it safe for two and all our needs are stated, emotional and behavioral. That's the state of the world I state to pull from the status quo but I can't make the change alone. That's why the day you join us is the favorite day to come. And they would laugh in dis disbelief, but their laughter did not kill me. Still, they shook my hand as we parted and the waxy feel of their aged skin clasped around my hand reminded me that I had to fight for them regardless, that I would be back to talk to them again soon, that no amount of laughter, no amount of fear 
was enough to end this quest because that fear, that bewilderment, that uncertainty with how everything would cohere in the end, that was proof that I was undertaking the good work. I clambered up the residential streets and watched Jim Shorten brothers stash their cigarillos upon seeing me in my little blazer and khakis or whatever. And I pretended not to know what weed smelled like as I approached their stoops and asked them what they wanted. And upon maybe their third time of seeing me with my clipboard, knocking on doors as I peered across the street and noticed there she was again, standing on their neighbor's stoop. We're on the third time I'd come to talk to them, they'd respond that they wanted programs for their kids, basketball, reading programs, mentorship programs, anything to keep them out of the street where they would become police targets, targets of senseless violence or perpetrators themselves. I told them more my ideas, less cops, more programs, jobs that really paid, came back again and they continued to remember me, dap me up. And I was not killed, instead I found new life in speaking my ideas to others and in seeing others, inviting others to speak their truth. But it was, wasn't just me out there, it never really is just one person. That's why coalition building, as I'd done through hip hop, was so critical. I had no political clout, no policy experience, but I did have this weird gaggle of frazzled service industry workers, hip hop musicians, rock and roll musicians for that matter, frazzled grad students, the folks who grieved their dreams of living on their art beside me over a beer at the end of brutal 14 hour kitchen shifts. The folks had, who had lived the consequences of bad public policy, the form of inadequate wages, no benefits, no leave time. And who, through seeing them authentically for that experience and being my authentic self as well, I was able to call into coalition to change the conditions that they had survived. I called together the folks fired for protesting discrimination in their workplaces, always scared of getting fired from someplace for you know, their natural hair or being too assertive as a woman or for whatever reasons their bosses came up that day because of the failure of bad public policy that they had survived living in a right to work state like Georgia. Through seeing them for that experience and being my authentic self, calling them into coalition to change the conditions that had shaped the outcomes of their lives. We'd built this movement already through the truths that we had shared. Not to say that those conversations and their aware, that awareness of the way that public policy had shaped their experience had prepared them for the task at hand. They'd be like, look, yo, I've never done this before, Mariah. I don't think I'm cut out for this. Is there any other way I can help but knock on doors? They were scared to death, but I assured them. Knock on one door. If it kills you, come back. If it does not kill you, knock on five more. And if that does not kill you, go through the whole list. Then you're done. You can do this. You can do this. In the art of winning commitment, Marion Edelman recalls Martin Luther King Jr. in his moments of gloom and depression when asked what the next step is, what the overall vision for the movement would be. I did not know then, but I recall now frequently his saying to take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. And I wish I'd known then what I know now with as much clarity and could have told my frazzled friends with their clipboards stepping out of my house to go knock on doors. What I will tell you now, that fear, like bewilderment, must be made a habit, normalized. Like bewilderment, it is a telltale marker that we are doing something great, and hard and worth doing. And believe it or not, knocking on doors did not kill my friends. They'd go out in pairs with their clipboards and their shoulders hunched like wary cage mice. They'd take their first steps, knock their first doors, discover themselves unmurdered by it. And step by step over three months, 
for three days a week, for three hours a day, we knocked on 1600 doors in my district and called and texted voters almost 3000 times. And on election day, we all stood outside of polling places for eight hours, waiting signs. My borrowed rain jacket might as well have been tissue paper under the barrage of sideways rain. And one of my political idols, an old white philosophy professor running for Congress at the time, showed up at the polling place I was at. He held up his umbrella with the sign, with a hand not holding the sign, and he asked me, do you think this kind of stuff was worth it? And I told him about how at numerous points throughout the day, folks had rolled down their car windows to ask if I knew who they should vote for. It was wild, but surely it had made a difference, right? He chuckled at this and soon he left. The rain cleared and the polls closed and I went home knowing that even if I lost, I had not failed. Because win or lose, putting yourself out there with bold new ideas about what our communities deserve and how we can achieve those pathways to a brighter future would transform our community's imaginations, raise their, their standards for public policy. And by inviting folks into conversation about what they envision for their neighborhood, that we were building coalition necessary for whatever fight came next. We were building community. Those conversations at the polls that day had mattered. Those conversations on the stoops had mattered. Those conversations at campaign HQ over beers with my frazzled, heartbroken friends had mattered because they had transformed our imaginations and brought us together for whatever fight, fight came next. Now, we all know how the story does end. Spoiler alert, it did make a difference. I was able to win my election by 13 votes. And I'd like to stress one more thing before I close. We may be policymakers, educators, students, professionals in various fields, but we cannot pretend to ourselves that our formal education is the only education that matters. I come to you today, not as an educator, not as a PhD student, a researcher, or even a politician. I say this to you as a person who is frequently still depressed by our political reality. Frankly, I have not slept the whole night through in months and more often than not wake up immobilized with panic about the day to come. But by now I'm used to it because I know great work is married to fear and uncertainty. I wake up and I stare my fear in the mirror while I brush my teeth, seeking not to dispel that fear, but to savor the taste, to hasten its pouring through my veins, to get drunk on it. I don't need a show of hands to know how many of you may at times feel the same terror that I feel, particularly if you are the first, the first in your family, the first of your race or gender or sexual orientation to take on, contend for and win power and wield it in ways that undo the harms in our community that shaped our basic experience. I know so many of you, especially in these times that we have survived, feel the same panic that I feel. And it gives me strength. I would not take back my years of emotional pain because sorrow and fatigue and uncertainty are central parts of the human experience. And I feel comfort knowing that my closeness to that center makes me closer to you who feel what I feel. I am comforted knowing that being open about these fears draws folks close. It allows you, I hope, to feel them out loud, to push them a, less, a little less deep down inside, let them poke their heads out, get a little bit of sun, 
and that drawing together of folks who are shocked by what we are seeing in our midst. Once drawn close, we can do the work. That's why I own this life. Own yours. Share yours. Take the chitlins and the pig feet and turn it into a delicacy. Create spaces for others to do the same in your classrooms, in your workplaces, in your homes, your churches, your communities, out loud, in public, because it heals us. It builds capacity for forward movement. It builds the movement. Once we embrace our stories, once, we empower others to embrace theirs. Once we support each other in healing through creation of those spaces of sharing, we can truly begin the work, the truly important work of addressing much of the ills of our current systems that this pandemic has laid bare. It will empower us to put our boots on the ground, venture out with our clipboards at times. Learning and loving across difference. To invite the holy, forgotten, and hard scrabble corners of our communities into the work with us. To further build, to further agitate, further change. And this work may discomfort you, it may scare you, it may bewilder you, but it will not kill you. Just take the first step, as Martin Luther King once said, in faith. But how do we deal with the anxiety of being ourselves? Especially in a queerphobic, transphobic, anti-Black, capitalist, sexist society. It's easier said than done, right? Oh, just go, just be yourself. Easier said than done. But I invoked my grandmother at the beginning and invoked Martin Luther King Jr. now and invoke them again here. Because I find strength in remembering the struggles of those that came before us. That the feeling that I feeling, that the feeling that I feel <laughs> is what my grandmother first felt when my mother walked out that screen door and down the dirt road to board the bus to go to that all white school on her first day. That countless people have felt in every struggle for liberation that has existed in this society as they were beaten, maced and arrested and snapped at by police dogs and dragged off of lunch counters, surveilled and hounded and grinded down upon at every turn by the forces which seek to keep the status quo. It may not feel familiar to you, but remember it is familiar to the work of all those that came before us, we are standing in their shoes. So when I step on to stage, I step into my mother's childhood shoes as she went to school that first day. The trembling in my fingers is the trembling in my grandmother's fingers as she sent her youngest daughter off to her all white school. I grab hold of the thread that ties us all, my mother to my grandmother to me, and inch along it forward in fresh struggle to claim space for myself and for my people. It is important to not only leap into the writing of new futures, but study the past to understand what those who came before us lived through and keep that alive in fresh struggle. And so in closing, I would like everyone once again to draw a deep breath, deep, 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 deep down to your stomach. 
Remember everyone before you that fought bewildered for the future that you have. Now imagine all the people suffering quietly in your midst, waiting for your permission to truly live, permission that you can grant by being your authentic self, being tired out loud, being terrified out loud, being black or poor from the block, being queer, being yourself, authentically yourself, as loud as you can. Imagine now the freedom that you can bring yourself through that radical act, that you will bring others and the work that we do together to ensure that the next pandemic, the next uprising, we are more well-resourced, we are well rested, we are healed, we are ready. Now, if you haven't yet, because that was a long deep breath, exhale with intention. Are you ready to work? That's all I have for you all today. My name is Mariah Parker. I really appreciate your time. And thanks to SDC for having me. Another round of applause for Mariah Parker. So Mariah, thank you. We hear that beautiful baby crying in the background. <laughs> I know, he's so upset. And that's oh, the revolution. You know, mom do, mom do. <laughs> so what we're gonna do uh, really quickly is because we always wanna leave time for questions and answers. I don't know if we have runners this morning, but I wanted you all to have time to pose questions to Mariah. You know, it's something when we get a linguist. Did I say it right, Mariah? A linguist. A linguist. <laughs> to, to speak because she bewilders us with her talent and her content at the same time. And she's a lyricist. So, you know, she dropped some bars in between there, you know? So I am impressed. I'm a fan. We have questions in the room. Uh, Mariah, do you have a moment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to take a few moments to answer some questions. The back. Yes, I have a question. I would, external multi-ethnic visibility seems to be a common thread of non-value of one's life, of oneself, whether there is a comfort which one to identify as a person or which one should be the uh, one that should be incorporated in different aspects of living. Do you find that that might be, uh, that these are people that are very seldom it's all about the dead of forgotten people in our society and why there is no self-value because it's not extended onto. So I think I heard the question okay. If I could have it repeated again, just so I could make sure that'd be really wonderful. Do you think that the people with multi-ethnic backgrounds, because trying to define who to identify with, depending upon the society that they're living in, that many times people forget that you're a composite of multi people. And then absolutely the society might try to choose which one you should be identifying with. Absolutely. And I experienced that intimately myself growing up as the descendant of Alawasta Pony Indians who are uh, based in the Piedmont area of North Carolina. But looking how I look and having parents look like how I look, having to be pigeonholed into the category of Black, which I'm very proud of. I love being a Black person but that erasure of my indigenous ancestry by the way that we categorize race as somewhat of a binary in the, in the United States. And so going back to one of the main themes in my talk, that's why it's so important for us to, to name these realities about our identity, um, whatever we can to whoever we can, because it helps fight, push back against that erasure. Um, it complexifies our discussions of solutions and of issues rather than saying these things happen to the black community thinking about how many other black people are also have indigenous ancestry 
um, as a way of making that conversation more robust and more authentic, more genuine, because we're actually addressing the totality of, 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 the, um, of, this, of the issue at hand. And so um, wherever you can, when we're talking about intersections of identity, it may be um, um, comfortable for us to lean back on what is vis visibly present, your skin color, your gender, your class markers and the way that you may dress or speak, but making visible the um, other aspects of our racial identity, multi-ethnic identity, as you say, um, so that people understand um, that, or, or so that people, so that collectively we are breaking down um, these, these binarizations, these compartmentalizations of identity, you're either this or that, and you can't be both. Um, push back on against the erasure of whole cultures that comes with um, identifying a person as one ethnicity or one gender or one nationality um, as a part of the work of, um, you know, just fighting back against white supremacy um, and other forms of oppression. Thank you. Any more questions? Now, come on, I know y'all got some questions for Ms. Parker or Mariah. I have a question. So Mariah, frequently in this industry that we are in, we deal with the false narrative about who represents poverty, um, where we come from and how that false narrative is used to continue to marginalize and divide. Can you talk about, especially being in a place like Athens, Georgia, how you were able to navigate that false um, assertion and bring people together on that, on that one cause of, look, we all poor and we all need this help? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going back again to another theme in my talk, that's why it's so important to have leadership that has experienced poverty and folks that have experienced intersecting forms of oppression, because we tend to you know, live in communities that for whom that is also true. And so we bring with us not only our own experience of what that means, but uh, a genuine sense of what those re of what those communities look like. And in Athens, Georgia, as in many places, it is actually very diverse. In the, the millennial generation, a lot of folks may come from middle class backgrounds, but we're now struggling to find living wage employment. And so a lot of my generational peers um, are struggling to get by, are struggling to keep the lights on. Um, the ways that um, educational attainment um, impact uh, the, our ability to feed our families and feed ourselves and, 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 and fight in, you know, for a future through, um, through gainful employment, um, the way that impacts it as well. Um, ultimately, I think it's really critical to look at it in, you know, in terms of from, from a lens of class to bring us all together in order um, to, to push back on, on that narrative, as well as the systems that keep people in poverty in the first place, rather than dividing and conquering, which I think is the point of the system that we have to keep this group fighting against that group for resources so that they don't take on the system that is oppressing them all. Instead, highlighting stories that um, create moments of connection of you know this person might be have might be white with blue hair and have in uh this person might you know be from the hood and uh you know this that and the other and you might not i'm calling them immediately looking at each other see how your lives are similar but and, but creating these moments of connection so that say hey we come together and share stories and have a more adequate picture of what poverty really looks like in our community the, the manifold families of different backgrounds that are impacted by this. Um, some more than other, others, it's true, but um, coming together to push back on those systems together and to also dispel those myths about who may be impacted or not by just genuinely sharing stories and building that coalition. I see Thank a question you. in the chat. So we have an from, online um, question and then we'll come to the yeah. questions that are in the room. Okay. Mariah, online on, in our virtual chat, we have a question that says, can you describe your support system? Yeah, um, so uh, support is everything. No one does anything by themselves, no one. It might seem really impressive. Oh, you're so young and you're an elected official. No, it is 
entirely because of the people that I made friends with through music, through working in the service industry, um, who today are still folks that, you know, I brought with me into the work, you know, into movement work, but also through the basic, just like getting by on the day to day. So um, friends of mine that are still working in kitchens all across the city, friends of mine who are musicians and, you know, get on stages every weekend to share the stories about the things that they have been through. Those are the same folks that are bringing our family meals right now, who come by the house maybe once a week to help to clean up, who I can call and vent about the toxicity and stress of being a politician. Um, the the folks with whom I built coalition through you know the story I described of putting myself out there, building that movement to run for office. Still today, um, I talk, I go on walks and talk to them about policy problems and what what they're facing in their own lives. Um, um, that, so it's not just support in terms of like emotional and social support; it's policy support. So you're from average everyday people about what it's really like out there. Um, and so I'm very thankful for my friends who have really held me close, especially as I had a baby two months ago. Um, and uh, just want to take the opportunity to remind everyone that no one does anything by themselves. That if we're talking about surviving and thriving, we're talking about resiliency, um, it's so important for us to remember the importance of community. We live in, an, we live in a society that really values individualism and um it's like a, it's a pseudo meritocracy where like if you got to the top you got to the top all by yourself fighting hard when everyone everyone who succeeds in anything does so because of the support they have so encouraging folks to reach out for help in your immediate community um or you know online resources whatever it takes for you to feel adequately supported in doing this difficult work Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sir Wayne Griffin. And my question is, do you think they should bring back the affirmative action program? Do I think they should bring back affirmative action programs? I think that the idea of affirmative action could be used in a more systemic way to bring economic relief and prosperity to communities that have been historically excluded. Let me give you an example. So um, a company might have to do affirmative action like hiring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But thinking about the ways that a municipality, for example, might have historically discriminated with regards to giving out city contracts, ensuring that small, small black or minority owned businesses um, are excluded from consideration, giving contracts every single time to the same white firms, et cetera. So, assist, so um, enacting governmental policies like that, where we're shifting it not only to hiring on an individual basis for this position or that position within a private, within the private sector, in the public sector, thinking about how we can um, put more money into the in, into black communities through working with black contractors, black plumbers, black electricians, black the folks that lay our um, Lay, lay our stormwater infrastructure, or build our sidewalks um, as a way of building up black entrepreneurship, um, as well as um, having that benefit also wrap around the folks who are employed within those firms. And so I guess I say that because within my specific field, as I'm working, you know, in the public sector and looking at issues like affirmative action from trying to look at it from um, like a systemic perspective with regards to a change in policies that will have the most benefit for the most people. That is what I've come to start to um, think. So not necessarily no, but thinking about it in new and different ways with regards to contracting and things like that, where we can make a huge difference in, in not only helping one person, but helping whole swaths of people um, within, within our hiring practices. The guy, uh, the reason why I say that uh, through the grace of God and the front of action program, I was able to retire from General Motors. There we go. See, yeah, it, it has had benefit for numerous, countless, countless thousands. Um, but thinking in creative ways about how we um, continue to improve that model for addressing previous discrimination and harm um, is one of the focuses of my work. When it comes to the war on drugs, do you think they should uh, get that more attention? Um, I think we need to end the war on drugs. I think that um, in the era of Reagan um, and Nixon, that when it became, it, it no longer became okay to be explicitly racist. 
um, focusing on criminals and crime and creating new policies that um, criminalize black and low income communities um, was a form of, of, of ensuring that Jim Crow evolved, ensuring that slavery in an essence evolved um, and was maintained through our carceral system. Um, that's money, you know, the, what's it, $80 billion our country spends on incarceration every year. It's money that's not going into our schools. It's money that's not going into economic development or healthcare. Um, things that when supplied to populaces at risk um, can help reduce our crime rate and make our community safer. And so um, I think the war on drugs is racist. I think the war on drugs needs to end. I think our communities deserve better in terms of resources and that we can do that by um, no longer over policing and over criminalizing and over incarcerating them. Okay, last question. D would you think we should uh, have more uh, entrepreneurship uh, classes for the students? I think so. Um, in addition to entrepreneurship, I would love to see us focus on cooperative, worker owned cooperative development. Because in the case of entrepreneurship, um, the boss might be getting ahead and, you know, building wealth, but it does not necessarily, um, it does not necessarily trickle down to the folks that work from them who may be, because they are a smaller firm, um, having to pay um, lower wages. However, if you have collective ownership of a business enterprise where it's de democratically run, so every worker that puts in, you know, a 40 hour work week gets to have say in things like their benefits, their schedules, their pay, um, that everyone equally pays in and everyone equally reaps the dividends is a uh, model that can uplift more people. Um, and so yes, with a caveat is that I would love to see us have more um, training in how to build worker cooperatives for young folks as well. So first of all, I wanna say amen to everything you just said. Thank you for that. Uh, can we talk about intersectionality for a moment? Sure. One of the things I loved is even reading your bio, listening to you speak, uh, you have uh, a multiple marked identity. And that's important to how you think, that's important to how you bring yourself to your work. And I, I, I think it's part of what makes you effective. The harsh reality is uh, many black folks struggle with intersectionality and, and they, uh, the, the prioritization of, of identifications are something that causes internal conflict and impedes the progress and impedes the, the togetherness we need to actually make things change. So I would love to hear you speak on how you help folks understand intersectionality, period, and how you might change minds so that we can remove some of that internal conflict. Yeah. Um, and so for background, I'm not sure if it's been discussed in the summit, but um, the term intersectionality stems from a case of uh, a, a, a legal case in which I think it was um, black female workers at an automotive factory um, were being discriminated against, but because they could not prove that it was on the basis of race because it wasn't happening to the black men, or could they prove it was on the basis of gender because it wasn't happening to the white women, um, the case, I can't remember if it got thrown out, but it gave rise to um, consideration within the field of legal studies of these ways that having multiple, as you said, marked identities can contribute to unique forms of oppression and discrimination. And so, um, and I agree, I absolutely agree that we are um, often called to prioritize a certain identity over another to say that to be this is not to be that. Um, as the saying goes, I believe there was a book once called All the Men Are Black, All the um, Women Are White, But Some of Us Are Brave. So this erasure of folks that take up spaces at these intersections, um, saying, oh, Black queers can't exist, or Black trans folks, or Black women even. Um, how our voices are silenced oftentimes in the public sphere, or just left out of conversations around policy. Um, again, I, I feel like a broken record here, but it can't be overstated that um, when we do occupy those intersections, speaking that as often as possible so that folks are reminded that you can be all of these things simultaneously and not one more than the other, but uniquely, something unique at that crossroads of two different you know, ways of being. Um, it's not that I come to you in conversation today 
only as a black person or a woman or a um, person who identifies as LGBTQ. Um, all of these things together have shaped my experience. And so that's why I speak it as often as I can to remind folks that we exist um, because oftentimes people just don't think about our existence at all, period. Um, but again, inviting others who may be in the room today, who may not feel comfortable sharing that kind of information or asserting that kind of lived experience and knowledge in a conversation to do so, because not only is it important for those folks to be considered in conversations around policy, you don't know what other ripples that could create in the room for the next person who shares. And then we come to see that that intersection that might seem marginal, might seem niche, is actually an experience that's very commonly held among the folks that you're in conversation with. So again, being yourself out loud in public, if you occupy those intersections, um, inviting others to do the same to ensure that those um, that the experiences at those intersections are included in the conversation is critical. Any more questions in the room? Go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for speaking. You're a brilliant speaker, I must say. My question is, you know, what are your biggest challenges that you have as a commissioner of Georgia? <sighs> My biggest challenges stem from just like the scope of local government and, and, and trying to challenge that. It's constrained by multiple things, unlike the federal government who can effectively, you know, has an effectively unlimited budget, um, especially if you like get into mon modern monetary theory. Um, local governments in the state of Georgia particularly are required to have a balanced budget. And so uh, we can't borrow money, you know, for things that aren't infrastructure in order to pay for community needs. We have to just like go off property taxes and that's it. And so as much as I would like to end homelessness by just providing housing for everyone, as much as I would like to fund um, municipal healthcare programs so that everyone has access to, you know, particularly mental health supports to help address our issue of our public safety issues in the community. As much as I would love to give everyone a living wage job, those are things the federal government could conceivably do, you know, particularly if they tax the rich, but uh, we can't do, we can't do um, here in Athens. And so while I think it's very important to freedom dream and think about, you know, what is the boldest, most um, innovative policy we could put in place to address this issue, to keep our sights on something ahead that we would like to achieve ultimately, the reality is that we are very constrained budgetarily. But in addition to that, we're also constrained by state law and by, we are preempted in a number of ways. We're preempted from raising the minimum wage. We're preempted from implementing rent control. We're preempted from uh, decriminalizing marijuana. A lot of these things that I think would be very transformational for our community, the state has already said you can't do. And so it requires being very creative with regards to workarounds that um, achieve similar ends. Um, it unfortunately requires a lot of um, management of expectations about the, the power of local government with folks that I talk to. Why is this this way? Why is this this way? Um, I wish I could do more. And so that has always been a struggle for me, keeping hope even in the midst of those uh, barriers, as well as creative, you know, approaching those barriers with creativity um, to figure out how we can achieve greater outcomes for you know, the people that I serve. Um, yeah, that's what I would probably say. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Because I got it. All right. You, because you know, I have I got time for one more question if possible. <laughs> you, I'll, I'll let you run that. Hello. Um, I was watching a clip with an interview with Condoleezza Rice this morning. I think she was on The View or The Talk or something. And they were talking about, um, Condoleezza was saying how, um, yes, we should implement Black history in school, um, but we need to do it in a way where we don't make the white children feel bad about being white. Um, so do you have any thoughts on that or any suggestions on how, you know, how, how do we go about that? Yes, we want to teach Black history, but of course, it, it's, we don't, well, I shouldn't say we, but white children shouldn't be unhappy that they're white. You know what I'm saying? So do you have any thoughts on that or any suggestions on how they can do that? Yeah, uh, thanks for that thoughtful question. I think that 
um, it is imperative that we have very open and honest conversations about the history of race in this country. But we also have to create spaces where children feel safe to share those emotions so that they can work through them. And ultimately leave the other side of it, not necessarily feeling guilty, but um, feeling a deeper connection with their classmates um, who may differ from them on the grounds of, grounds of race. Um, for example, if a student learning about the history of slavery feels really just feels really bad that this happened that people that from whom they may descend did that kind of thing creating space in our classroom to talk about that how does that make you feel um so that uh folks um can work through yeah work through those really tough feelings and uh, ultimately still come away from the experience with a healthy sense of self with perhaps a sense of duty towards continuing to redress um existing harms but uh guilt uh feeling bad about who you are does not help anyone um it's a it's a place of paralysis that prevents you from acting on the information that you have about what is wrong um you can stop for a second um and reflect but you've got to keep moving forward with that sense of duty of like hey i want to make the world a better place for my classmates who i love and get to you know play blocks with every day so um, as an educator, putting on my educator hat here for a second, um, as a, someone that studies um, education um, in my PhD program, I would say creating space for conversations around our feelings about talking about those hard parts of history can help diffuse some of the toxicity that, you know, re, the, re, the re-traumatization that folks can face by um, talking about these difficult things that are, you know, unfortunately cornerstones of our society. And with that, I got to run. This so baby is just crying, 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 crying. So thank you all so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. We appreciate you. Bye-bye. So everyone, we have a little bit of time left um, be before we go into our workshops. They're not scheduled to start until 1030. So we can, you know how we always do, reflect and decompress, or we can begin to move into the, the um, pre-function area so that you can get ready for your workshops. Dr. Hinton has something for us. Um, I, this has been this has been on my heart ever since we started this. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about poverty, poverty, we personalize it. You know, we personalize it how it affects us or me or people who look like me. And while I I completely agree and understand. I think sometimes we have to make sure that we open ourselves up to the harm of others who don't have the lineage or background or um, obvious, um, like I'm dark skinned, so you know it's obvious that I'm an African American or defined as an African American. But you know, when I think about the audience that we have, even some of the people that are supporting us today or listening to this, some of our staff who are not African American, I think about it from the standpoint of how do we make sure people don't feel like we're not talking about them too? And how do we understand that even through the process of the systems of this country, sometimes the people whose voices need to be heard are sometimes not heard because others are speaking for them. We always look at, and I'm gonna use an example, we always look at the white voice as the people who are nationalists. I would argue that's a small percentage of white folks. And I would argue that maybe white folks should speak up and say, don't speak for me. Because it, 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 it's interpreted by people who are not white as you implicitly agree. Okay. Now we, as a people of color, need to be tolerant and open to the fact that there are a lot of people in pain in this country. 
we talk a lot about how do we build allies, but we do it by including people who have common goals, common needs, and common opportunity, needs for opportunity. Bring them in. Understand. Appreciate the complication of the oppression and the sophistication of the oppression. Part of the divide and conquer is to make sure you never have a chance to talk, find common ground, have share the historical experience of our history in a way that we all learn and can appreciate that there is opportunity to be rich, enriched by understanding each other's perspective on the history of this country and then grow together. So that's been, it's on my heart because uh, can't help but think about my own family, how we can do better. That as a leader of a very diverse organization, and I know I have people in my organization who care deeply about the work that we do. This is not just about a black thing. Although we have a lot, a lot of reasons why we should be fussing about it, there are more people who are impacted by this issue called poverty and systemic exclusion from opportunities to be able to take advantage of the great resources that this country has. So that's just a statement more than anything. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hinton. You know, one of the things that really stood out for me, you, you know, we live in Milwaukee and we know who them Kia boys are, right? So when Mariah was talking about the pain and the angst and the lack that she felt and the not having an outlet to express that, thinking that she was in it by herself. It made, cause I, I'm telling you, I, I've been hard on them Kia boys and, and with this reckless driving. But when she started to talk about how that um, subconscious voice started to approach her about self-harm, when you really think about it, the risky behavior that these Kia boys have been taking is really an act as, of self-harm. We just are casualties of it. So it made me think that we have more work to do to hold space for the kids that we think are unreachable. We, we got to do something different. It really made me realize, because you know what? These babies belong to somebody and they didn't get like this by osmosis. You know what I'm saying? So we gonna have to take ownership um, of helping them find their path to healing. That was the most profound thing that she said. Her hurt was leading her to self-harm. And many of these young people who are stealing cars, driving recklessly through the city of Milwaukee are self-medicating, just like she said they are just using these vehicles as outlets of their expression of pain. Not making excuses, but I'm just telling you, I, and, and anybody who knows me know, ain't nobody been harder on them Kia boys than me. I got a Sonata. <laughs> so, you, you know what I'm saying? But I just want us to think about that differently. So having said that, if nobody else has a comment or a reflection that they'd like to share, I'd like to release us to decompress and be in those workshops on time at 1030. Any questions? We've got a question or a statement. Okay, when it comes to the, I'm not familiar with that name, but I know what they've been doing, the Kill Boys. Uh, I was in the military also, and uh, I found that 
if uh, instead of sending them to jail, well, one thing, uh, take away the cars, but a police officer told me when you take away the cars, they just go steal another one. But me being in the military, I think they, 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 they shouldn't. Yeah. Statement is finished. I think with the Kia boys, what they should do is send them to like a boot camp. Don't send them to jail, but send them like a six month boot camp where they uh, where they rejuvenating their minds to something more positive. Because when I went into the military, that was the best thing that happened to me. So that's just my, my statement. Thank you for that observation. I have heard many men talk about how these types of structured activities have been pivotal to them in, um, in changing their direction. Thank you for your contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see you back in here at 12 o'clock sharp. Thank you. <laughs>